Good evening, and thank you for joining today, our Zoom webinar. This is the second webinar in a series of three that we're hosting this week. My name is Vicki Dodge, and I'm the senior planner with the City of St. Albert. I'm the project manager for the annexation project. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to review the information about the annexation agreement that was reached recently, and as well to talk about uh, some of the transition matters that have come up through this process. We're also going to receive and answer as many questions from you, the attendees, as we can in the hour that we have for this meeting. Before we get to the presentation, which is pre-recorded for consistency across the three meetings, there are a few housekeeping items I need to go over. This meeting is being recorded. The information in this session is being collected under the authority of Section 33C of the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. For the purpose of administering this event, the use, retention, and or disclosure of all information collected by the City of St. Albert is protected by the provisions of the FOIP Act. This recording uh, is intended to be put onto the website and may be shared on our social media platforms. Attendees, your video is not enabled. We cannot see you. We will not see you the entire time. You are also muted. And we've, if you have the opportunity to ask a question, then you'll be asked to unmute yourself. And we will uh, go ahead allow you to speak and then we'll put you back on mute. If you have any technical difficulties, please use the chat function to describe the issue you're having and we'll do our best to help resolve that for you. Please don't use the chat function to ask your questions or we might miss them. So we do have uh, some information on how to ask questions. We'll get into that a little later. With those housekeeping items out of the way, I'd like to introduce our panel. This evening, I'm joined by Darren Young from ISL Engineering. Darren is going to be our technical expert on our panel tonight. Greg Weiss from Corvus Business Advisors is our financial expert. We have Christina Peter from the City of St. Albert. She's the manager of the planning branch and will uh, be answering questions related to land use and planning. We have Mayor Kathy Heron, who is here representing the city's annexation negotiating committee. And we also have Deputy Mayor Toms from Sturgeon County, who's representing the county's annexation negotiating committee. As I mentioned, uh, the recording or the presentation that we're about to present is pre-recorded and we will have that Q&A session that follows. They were, the uh, presentation is about 15 minutes long, so hopefully we have about 40 minutes to get into your questions. So we're just going to have that presentation loaded up and start in about uh, 10 seconds here. One moment, please, while we load that video. Thank you for joining us today for what is one of the last formal opportunities to learn about the outcomes of this annexation project and about the upcoming application review process with the Municipal Government Board. The purpose of today's meeting is to share information and key outcomes of the annexation negotiations, as well as to answer as many questions as we can in the hour that we have. As you may already know, this project started in April of 2017, when the City of St. Albert gave notice of its intent to annex land from Sturgeon County. Since then, much work has been undertaken in support of the City's annexation application, including interviews with affected owners and agencies, open houses, questionnaires, and technical background studies. Along the way, the City has tried to keep interested parties informed of developments through regular media releases, updates to its website, and through newsletters. In August, the Annexation Negotiating Committee, which comprises three elected officials and the CAO from each municipality, concluded its negotiations and reached an annexation agreement. The agreement was approved by the councils of the City of St. Albert and Sturgeon County shortly after that. The City is now preparing its formal application package that will be submitted to the Municipal Government Board in early December of this year. In the City's intent to annex notice, we saw the first suggested annexation boundary called the Maximum Potential Annexation Area. This boundary was loosely based on prior intermunicipal planning discussions between the two municipalities and was established as a starting point for negotiations. The Maximum Potential Annexation Area is shown on this map with the black dashed line. The Annexation Negotiating Committee considered additional information gathered from the public during the November 2019 open houses, as well as the growth and development needs of both the city and the county in order to arrive at the final negotiated annexation boundary shown on this map with a red dashed line. This boundary was presented publicly in April of 2020. 
This boundary comprises approximately 1,588 hectares, or 3,923 acres, and has a 45-year land supply. This land supply includes both residential and non-residential land supply estimates. We'll note that there are no growth or development plans for River Lot 56 or for the Pound Makers Lodge. In addition to the boundary, the Annexation Negotiating Committee decided on a number of other important matters, including compensation, road jurisdiction, taxes, and a commitment to as smooth a transition as possible for former county residents. The city and the county agreed to a compensation amount of $600,000, and that all roads and road rights of way shown in green on this map would transfer to the city. This includes all roads along the boundary of the annexation except for portion of Township Road 544 in the northwest corner. Taxation was a dominant concern that came up at the prior open houses. The Annexation Negotiating Committee agreed to a 45-year tax protection. In other words, starting in the year the annexation becomes effective, which is proposed to be 2022, former county owners will pay the lower of county or city taxes unless a shift to the city tax rates is activated. A shift to city tax rates is activated in three ways. First, if an owner requests a subdivision approval that would result in more than four parcels on a quarter section. Second, if an owner requests a redistricting or rezoning of their property. And last, if an owner requests to be connected to city water, sanitary sewer, or both. The next few slides will be reviewing various transition topics. These are the day-to-day -to -day topics that came up as main themes at the last round of open houses. There's a topic that you have in mind that's not discussed here. Please bring it up during the question and answer period. Let's start with land use. A number of people at the last round of open houses were concerned that the way they use their land will change after annexation or that they'll be forced to develop. What's being proposed is that people will continue to be able to use their land in the same ways they would have been permitted to use the land under the existing agricultural district. No one is going to be forced to develop their land if they don't want to. The city will apply its own land use district on the newly annexed land, but that land use district would be a blend of the county's existing agricultural district and the city's urban reserve district. This would be allow for flexibility so that you can still use the land in the same ways that you're used to, with some reasonable restrictions on future subdivision and development so that uh, orderly and efficient urban development could occur in the future. The new land use district would need to be approved by city council and would include a public process so that you would have an opportunity to speak your views before council before a decision is made on that land use district. Another transition topic area is business licensing. The negotiating committee decided that all businesses in the annexation area, existing and new, will require a business license. However, to ease that transition, a five-year fee waiver would be in place starting with the effective date of annexation. Farming operations would remain exempt under provincial legislation. Pet licensing would fall under the city's animal control bylaw and requires all dogs to have a license, but cats are not licensed in the city of St. Albert. Emergency services would continue to be provided at usual levels and the city and the county maintain mutual aid agreements to help with servicing rural areas. Municipal addressing would change to the city's addressing protocols and the city would be able to enforce its own bylaws within the annexation area. Fire pits and controlled burning would follow the existing county rules until the area is developed to an urban standard, at which point the city's rules would apply. Noise control and RV parking would be subject to the city's bylaws. Off-road vehicles and ATVs will continue to follow the county's rules on public roadways until the area is developed to an urban standard. Mosquito control falls under the city's integrated pest management plan, and what this means is that the city uses an integrated approach to mosquito control that currently doesn't include spraying. The city of St. Albert does not allow fireworks to be set off unless you are a licensed pyrotechnician. The concerns raised at the open houses last November focused on potential impacts to agricultural operations and the agricultural way of life. Specifically, we had questions about firearm use post-annexation for crop and livestock protection. We can confirm that firearm use on private land is regulated by the province of Alberta, and the annexation is not going to change that. However, firearm use on public land is prohibited in the city of St. Albert. Existing fuel storage tanks for agricultural operations will remain exempt from the city's bylaw and permitting processes. However, new installations will require prior city approval. 
Outdoor storage for agricultural operations is exempt from city's bylaws. However, unsightly premises can still be required to put up fencing or some sort of screening if that's deemed necessary by the city. And noxious weed control falls under the city's integrated pest management plan, which notes that noxious weeds are addressed under the Weed Control Act of Alberta, and that act requires owners to control noxious weeds to prevent their propagation and spread. Many folks were wondering about the maintenance levels to expect on roadways after annexation. And we can say that roadways will be maintained to the same county standards as before annexation. Once urban development occurs, road maintenance will be in accordance with the city's standards for urban roadways. Also, road naming will be in accordance with the city's road naming protocols. And finally, household waste management was a concern that was brought up at the open houses last November. People living in the annexation area will be able to use the city's Mike Mitchell Recycling Center for household recyclables. This is located in the Campbell Business Park. As for household garbage, the city of St. Albert, in collaboration with Sturgeon County, is pursuing talks with Rose Ridge Waste Management Service Commission. This is the commission that manages the Rose Ridge landfill. Because the commission is an independent third party, the city and the county and the commission need to sit down and talk about ways to allow former county residents to continue to use the landfill until curbside garbage pickup is available in the city. Uh, in the annexation area, curbside pickup would likely not be available until urban development takes place. This brings us to the end of the transition topics. And I'd like to provide you with information now about the upcoming Municipal Government Board application process and how you can get involved. But first, I'd like to define what the Municipal Government Board is. The Municipal Government Board is an independent and impartial quasi-judicial board established under the Municipal Government Act. Its job is to make decisions about land planning and assessment matters. The Municipal Government Board is not the decision-making authority for annexations. That authority rests with the province of Alberta. Rather, the Municipal Government Board reviews applications for annexation, evaluates their merits, and then writes a recommending report to the Minister of Municipal Affairs. The decision from the province is called an order in council. As discussed at the beginning of this presentation, the next step in the annexation project is for the City of St. Albert to submit its application to the Municipal Government Board. Once the Municipal Government Board has the city's application, it will send notifications regarding the annexation to all the affected parties as well as to the public. And if an objection is received, then the Municipal Government Board will set a date and a time for a hearing to allow all people to have that opportunity to speak before the board. Anyone who feels they would like to speak before the board can register to do so with the Municipal Government Board. And this would be the last opportunity to have your input heard in this annexation process. So once the Municipal Government Board has concluded its hearing process, it will compile its findings into a recommendation report and send that to the Minister of Municipal Affairs seeking a decision. If the province decides to approve the annexation, the city would be notified and we expect that notification to come in by the end of next year. The city has asked for an effective date of January 1st, 2022. And once that decision is made, then the city can start mobilizing on its transition activities, including crafting that transitional land use district and doing those other bylaw amendments that would be required. The city will also send out a transition handbook to all the affected households in the annexation area. This will summarize a lot of the information presented here today, as well as provide other important and useful information for new city residents. And I'll end the presentation by saying the city remains committed to ongoing communication throughout this application process. It will continue to update its website, issue newsletters, media releases as required, and take inquiries by email and by phone. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me by email or by phone listed here. That concludes the presentation segment of today's meeting. We'll move now into the live question and answer period. You're on mute, Vicki. <laughs> Flub up number one of the night. Thank you. Thanks for keeping track too, Beth. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, all right. Thank you for holding your questions during the presentation. Now is the time to get ready to type them into your question and answer box or to raise your hand and ask to speak your questions. So with us tonight is Beth Sanders. 
who you just heard speaking, uh, reminding me that I was muted. And Beth Sanders has worked with uh, this project for quite some time, helping the negotiating committee facilitate its discussions and help with the negotiation process. And so she was a natural fit to help us moderate our live Q&A session. And with that, Beth, I'll turn it over to you and mute myself. Okay, thanks, Vicki. So my role Tonight is essentially traffic direction. So there'll be questions that come from you folks that have joined the call and I'll receive the questions and then I'll point them in the right direction. So if it's a technical question about bylaws, that kind of thing, I'm gonna to go to Vicki. If it's about engineering development, how things will unfold, probably we'll connect with Darren with ISL engineering, financial stuff, taxation, that kind of tricky stuff, I'm going to go to Greg with at Corvus. And if there's questions about um, planning and future development, what are the city's plans? Christina's on hand from the city of St. Albert to do that. And I'm going to refer questions of a technical nature to those four folks. And if there happens to be a question that's more political in nature, then we have two members of the Annexation Negotiating Committee in Mayor Kathy Heron from the City of St. Albert and Deputy Mayor Kristen Toms from Sturgeon County. So that's who we've got on hand. We've got a nice, robust, more than 40 minutes available to hear questions and answer questions. And I'm just going to lay out how this is all going to work before we jump in. So the first thing is, is anyone who asks a question needs to identify themselves. And there are two ways to ask a question. On the bottom of your screen, if you feel like writing your question rather than speaking it, you can click on the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen if you're on a computer and you're gonna swipe back and forth if you're on a phone or a tablet. On the bottom, what you're gonna see is two speech bubbles and it says Q&A. You can write a question in there. If you would like to speak your question, you simply need on the bottom of your screen on a computer or if you're on an iPad or a tablet, touch it and then you might need to swipe back and forth. You're gonna see raise hand. And if you raise your hand, I'm gonna be able to see that you have your hand raised and I'll be able to call on you. I'm gonna go back and forth between spoken and written questions. Um, I'm also going to go to new people who haven't yet had a chance to ask a question if we've got a whole bunch of questions from the same person. Um, my objective is to accommodate as many questions as possible. So what that means is I'm looking for people asking questions to ask a concise question. And I'm also looking for panelists to provide a concise answer. Okay, it goes two ways. Um, and I'm gonna read out all questions for transparency. If it comes to pass that a question is asked that it's already been answered, I'm gonna read it anyway. And then we'll just say that, yes, that question's already been answered. Um, and then I'll just move on to the next question. Um, just a reminder to everyone that the call is recorded, which means we just want you to know that it's being recorded and it's available for people to watch or listen to later. It also means that you can re-listen to an answer that you get if you'd like to do that later. So some basic tips to make this work as well as possible is the chat function in Zoom. If you're familiar with that, please leave it for anyone who has a technical question because we don't want to miss anyone. Um, and we've got some folks behind the scenes that can help if you're trying to remember how to ask a question or something's not working. Raise your hand to ask a question if you'd like to speak it. Q&A if you want to write your question. Um, and then the only last thing I feel like I want to say is we're all doing the best that we can in this strange COVID situation. Ideally, we would all be in the same room face to face, but we're not. So let's just all remember <laughs> that sometimes we don't show up at our best. Sometimes we do the best we can and we're all in that same boat right now. So I'm asking for a little extra effort on everyone's behalf to be um, to be respectful and civil and all of that, because this is a tricky, a tricky, complicated discussion that we're here to have tonight. So um, with that, um, I'm looking for some questions and we've got nine people attending. So if you have a question, please feel free to ask. And it's possible many questions were already answered in Vicki's presentation. 
Um, we will that, not drag but... this meeting out <laughs> unnecessarily, but I do have a written a written question from Kareem. Okay, I, perfect. So Kareem Beth, asks. Before we start, can I just get you to, I'm not sure if anyone's um, participating by phone. No, there's no one participating okay. by phone. I can see that. Yeah, thanks for checking, Christina. So Kareem's question is, can I expect land value in the annexation area to increase? And I'm going to refer to Greg on that, please. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Um, the short answer is uh, yes, most research uh, indicates that land values in rural municipalities that are part of annexations uh, tend to go up. But the amount uh, that land values go up really varies um, by location. Um, this can be as little as a couple of thousand dollars to a, uh, per acre to as much as $40,000 per acre is what some of the research um, uh, indicates. Um, most of that uh, increase is a result of land being bid up from competing uh, land use uh, activities. That's where most of the increases tend to come from. Um, but as I say, the, the research is, is few and far between and is very dependent on, um, on local areas and, and location of the land itself. But then the short answer is, is yes. Darren, did you have anything you'd like to contribute to this as well? I know you've got a perspective too. Yeah, um, one of the tricky things about the questions relating to land value is, is if the question is being asked from an assessed value perspective or a market value perspective. And so um, my recollection uh, on the market value perspective was, uh, was basically what Greg delivered in terms of an answer. And Greg, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, can you, can you um, also speak to the assessed value impacts associated with annexation and relate that back to the annexation um, activations and the, um, the grandfathering aspect of the uh, proposed conditions of annexation? Thanks, Darren. Go ahead, Greg. Sure. Um, yes, uh, there's, there's two types of values, market value and, and assessed value. Uh, market value was what I was just speaking about, the, the value of the land in the marketplace from one seller to another uh, buyer. Assessed value is the value that a, a piece of land is assessed by the local government for the purposes of calculating uh, taxes. Now, obviously, the two are linked together as market values tend to increase, then so too assessed value tends to increase. Assessed value though can be dictated by the improvements that uh, an owner puts on their land, uh, et cetera. Um, as was mentioned in the initial uh, presentation, um, one of the things the city is requesting as a part of its annexation application is that um, land essentially be grandfathered for the uh, term of the annexation. And what that means uh, from an assessment perfect, uh, perspective is that it would be assessed in the same manner as it is um, uh, today. So for example, if uh, uh, land in the annexation area is designated as exempt uh, today, it would continue to enjoy that exempt status uh, going forward. So the assessment, um, the assessment formula, if you will, or designation would remain um, the same moving forward in time. Okay, thanks, Greg. And uh, Kareem, if that leaves you with other questions, please feel free to ask them. We've got lots of time for that tonight. I have a, a next question from Chad, who's a resident of St. Albert in Deer Ridge, and this is what he has to say. To me, it seems that St. Albert would be a good home for a university. Has this ever been discussed as a possibility for the potential new lands? So I'm going to start with Christina on that one. Uh, thank you very much, Chad, for that question. Um, it's a very good one. The main goal, one of the main goals with this annexation was to find additional lands for the city of St. Albert to have um, non-residential activities. And this is something like a university. Um, it could also be for commercial and some light industrial um, activities. Um, I will we haven't specifically looked at a location in the annexation areas for an institutional use like a university, 
But I will say that through the Municipal Development Plan project, which is also concurrently going on at the City of St. Albert, we have identified that as a significant opportunity for the city. Um, we don't have anything in the queue right now, but we have looked for um, good lands for a university and it would depend on what the university needs are. They're looking for a, a campus style. There are some opportunities that exist already and will be probably easier serviced within the existing footprint of St. Albert, but we also have um, universities that are looking for already built up areas. So we do have some opportunities that exist um, in and along St. Albert corridor and when within the downtown as well, where there's an opportunity to um, add some institutional uses like the a university. Good. Um, Thanks, Christina. I've got another written question and I just wanna mention for anyone who's comfortable with speaking your question, when you speak the question, it's, it's much easier for us to have a little bit of a back and forth where you could have a bit of a conversation with one of the panelists and then it's not so abrupt. You ask the question, they answer the question and then it's over. So I just offer that up if you're, if you're comfortable and you'd like to speak. When you speak, we do not see you, just so you know that. Okay, a next question from BG Booth. Will my agricultural tax rate remain consistent for the next 45 years if my farm remains status quo? So Greg, that's a question for you, please. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, the answer to that question is no, your agricultural tax rate um, could change from year to year. Tax rates within municipalities, all municipalities can go up, they can go down from year to year. What the City of St. Albert has done uh, as part of its application though, is to request that your tax rate be grandfathered. And then what that means is that you would enjoy the lower of either the county or the city tax rate for your land in a specific year. So if your tax rate in the county uh, for a given year happens to be lower than the city rate in that category, then you would enjoy the county tax rate for that year. So you would always be guaranteed to have the lower tax rate um, for the entire annexation um, uh, period. And Greg, that just to be clear, like Greg's question is if my farm remains status quo. So your answer is spot on there, I think, right? Yeah, that's correct. If it remains okay. status quo and does not, um, it is not activated by one of those three activation triggers that was described in the um, in the presentation at the outset. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for that. So B G Booth. Don't know your your first name. I'm guessing your last name is Booth. Um, if you have any subsequent questions, please feel free to, to ask them. And I don't see any questions right now, but we're, we're gonna stay here. Oh, here comes one. Uh, here we go, BG Booth again, asks the question, any chance of getting waste privileges closer to St. Albert? And his name is Barry Booth. Thank you, Barry. I'd much rather call you Barry. <laughs> any chance of waste? privileges closer to St. Albert. So Vicki, I'm going to send that one over to you. Thanks, Beth. So my understanding of what your question is, I think, is that you're looking for access to either a landfill that's closer to St. Albert or some sort of waste um, services where you could go in and deposit waste in a bin or something like that, I think is probably what you're asking. Um, going back to the presentation discussion about waste management, the intent of the city and the county in, in its negotiation discussions was to have the people who are in the annexation area still maintain their existing access to Rose Ridge landfill. So if that's something that's, be, in, that's in the works and uh, as soon as those discussions have concluded, uh, we're hopeful that we have an arrangement where that, would, that privilege would remain intact. Um, if for some reason we weren't able to secure access to Rose Ridge, then the city of course would have to identify some alternative. And what that alternative is right now, we don't know, but it would definitely be something that would uh, take the place of, of your former access. So you wouldn't and be Vicky, without- I just see um, a comment by Barry that he's looking for something closer than Morinville. Mm. I, no, I don't think that there is a, a landfill closer. I think the Rose Ridge one is the closest one. And then the next one would be Edmonton, which would be outside of the city's jurisdiction. Okay. Um, 
So they wouldn't be able to create a relationship like that, I don't think, with the city of Edmonton. So okay. your best bet would be to continue to use the Rose Ridge. And that is the, the road, the path that the negotiating committee is taking, trying to secure that continued access. Okay. Thanks, Barry. And if you're, if you're needing a little bit more information and you want to have a, a back and forth with Vicki, just raise your hand and then I'll, I'll call on you and you can speak. I've got a, I've got Chad has raised his hand. So we'll have an audio one here. So we just need to enable, I've got something funny happening about enabling. There we go. So okay, Chad, so you I, will, there we go. It's working. Thanks. Great. So I, I noted uh, the additional response for, from the mayor um, about discussions with uh, Athabasca which I think is great if that's a, if that's a potential. Um, I was just brainstorming. I'm doing an MBA right now at the U of A. Um, I'm a retired engineer in the military where I was for 28 years. And so I worked a lot with infrastructure. I'm just wondering, um, there's a, a First Nations university in Saskatchewan and I was wondering if anyone had ever thought to sort of incorporate a First Nations university within the boundaries of St. Albert, it would sort of tie into, um, I think it's Treaty 6, right, that we're, that we're part of here. Just, uh, just as, a, as an idea, if that had ever been discussed or could be potentially discussed in the future. Thanks. Sure, thanks. Thanks, Chad. I'll send that over to Kathy, Mayor Kathy Heron, please. Thanks, Beth. I did unmute myself. Chad, kind of kind of outside the realm of annexation. So happy to take this offline if you ever want to send me a quick email and I can give you my email address. Um, but to be quite honest, First Nations University has not been a, a conversation that we've been having. I actually hadn't thought about it. So um, side bonus of today's conversation is opportunities that come up for St. Albert. So why don't you send me an email and we have a coffee? But um, as Christina said, it, it has been uh, identified that post-secondary education would be um, a key and synergistic opportunity for St. Alba. We have a fairly highly educated um, population and we want to capitalize on that. So why don't we actually kind of take this kind of offline if that works for you? Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Okay, I'll, I'll send you my email in the chat. Thank you. Okay, okay. sure. Thank you, Chad. And I need to ask one of my technical people to lower Chad's hand. Thank you. For some reason, I don't have those powers, so thanks. Okay, Kareem has another question. When will city services like sewer, et cetera, be available? Christina, you wanna start with that one? Sure, I can do that. Um, just had to find my unmute button. Um, so when will city services like sewer, water, sanitary, um, even maybe curbside pickup, these are all um, activities that we associate with urban development. And so it really depends on when the parcels get developed. We are not looking at extending any urban servicing um, unless it's being requested, so either by a developer or by a landowner. However, when you do get your services extended, that will trigger the taxation um, holiday or whatever. Uh, I don't know if there's a better uh, term for that, but the taxation rate would then switch to an urban um, taxation rate. So we, the closer you are to the city, more than likely will be the closer opportunity for you to actually get some of these urban services. Okay, thank you, Christina. All right, I have another question from Barry. Is the land designated to be zoned residential or is there the possibility for land to be zoned industrial? So Christina, that's another question for you. Yes, so at the beginning, the lands will probably be some sort of zone of agricultural and they'll be based off of the existing agricultural land use designations that the that the that Sturgeon County currently has. One of the um, as Vicki noted earlier, one of the key activities over the next year, year and a half while this application is going forward, um, it gives the city of St. Albert staff an opportunity to go through and see what type of land uses are out in these um, 
annexed, potentially annexed areas, and we'll be able to write them into the new land use district. Um, but it will be, uh, it'll be an agricultural type district or inspired by agricultural type uses. Moving forward, the other activity that has to occur is once these lands become part of St. Albert, we will have to incorporate them into our into a municipal development plan. And a municipal development plan is the long range future land use plan for the city. Um, right now we're undergoing a, a similar activity. It's called Flourish. So once this is done, we would incorporate these lands into um, Flourish's um, document. And at that stage, we would be looking at, is this going to be a future industrial, a future residential, or um, a future commercial mixed use um, area? Now, then you would get to your zoning. So there's quite a few stages before you get to actually rezone, um, but the city does want to have some direction provided to the people who live within the annexation areas. Um, but we won't have that until after the annexation has been approved by the province, if it is approved by the province. Okay, that so sounds good. It's a complicated Thanks. and long is, answer, and I do it, apologize for that. The short answer, though, is, is it remains as it is until the land is in the city and you'll, you'll come up with a transition district, which largely is going to keep it the way it is. So the real activator is going to be when a land developer comes along and decides they want to do something quite different than agricultural. Greg, I just want to check and see if you have something to add. Um, sure, thank you. I was just to build on uh, Christina's answer for the last two questions. Um, um, something that um, the attendees would probably find useful and helpful when the technical documents are uh, published, there are two maps in there um, that they will see. One is a very high level preliminary land use map and also a land staging uh, map that, um, that points to the best guess as to when that land is scheduled to develop and therefore when maybe services are expected to be received. So that's something that attendees can take a look at and see where they live and, and get some a very high level estimate of when those kinds of things may occur in the future. Thanks for that addition, Greg. I have another question uh, from Barry. What happens to the homestead once the property is destined to be developed? Vicki or Christina? Christina, you go for it. I can give it a try again. Um, so that is actually really up to the person who owns the homestead and how they've sold uh, the property possibly to a land developer or if the landowner themselves is going to take on the responsibility of developing. Um, we do have existing homesteads that are currently incorporated within the city of St. Albert um, and they've continued to function as a homestead, you know, they're, they're a small little homestead still in the city. However, they do not have necessarily access to all of the city services like water and sanitary and sewer. So it, it is up to the owner to make the decisions on what's going to happen to that homestead. So Christina, I'm imagining there's two scenarios. So one would be if the homestead is owned by person A, but the rest of the quarter, say, was sold off and the developer is going to develop around the homestead. That's one scenario. And the homestead gets to stay until that owner decides to sell it off, right? Exactly. Or there are sometimes there are agreements between the person who owns the homestead and the developer, and the developer will ensure that they're servicing to those sites. Yeah. But and that then is another scenario is going to be the entire quarter and the homestead is owned by the same person and then they're gonna to choose to develop the way they want, which could be keep the homestead or not keep the homestead. That is exactly correct. Now, there are obviously, you'd have to fit into the zoning about parcel sizes and setbacks and all of those yeah. lovely things that get very confusing, but um, it, it essentially is up to the person who owns the property to propose their idea regarding how the homestead will be developed. Okay, thank you, Christina. Thank you, Barry, for that question. And I'm looking for another question, if there's one floating out there. 
It could be that questions were answered in the, in the presentation. It could be that this is a lot of information and you need some time to process it and that is just fine. Um, there's no such thing as a stupid question. I'll, I'll also say that. And there's also an opportunity tomorrow night to put questions to virtually the same panel. The elected officials will, will switch out, but everyone else will be here tomorrow afternoon at two. And Vicki, maybe now is a good time for you to describe the virtual engagement that's underway. And um, you get a chance to describe that. And if another question surfaces, great. If not, then we'll, we'll let people go. Sure, yeah, thanks. So in addition to these webinars that we're having, we also have what's called a virtual information session and that is accessed through the city's website, um, stalbert.ca forward slash annexation. And right when you get to that first page, there's a cl click the link to get to these events and you can click on the link to stalbertinfo.ca, I believe it is. And that takes you to a virtual information session, which is pretty neat. It, uh, it loads this room that you can navigate through using your mouse or your uh, your finger if you're on a touch screen and you can it's as though you're walking through a virtual room and all the display boards are set up around the room and there's a table with uh, display handouts and uh, consent forms um, and so it's really almost like you're going through a, a standard open house like you would in pre-covid days where you walk into the room you see all the display boards there's people standing at the display boards you go up to the display board you click on it it enlarges so you can read all the information on it, and then you can move to the next board. Um, also in that location, if you're one of the affected owners and you're in support of the annexation in principle, then you can fill out a consent form that just says that you're in favor of it. You can fill out your consent form uh, by clicking on the link in the virtual information session. It takes you to a fillable form on our website, and it's really easy. You just have to have your, your unique parcel number that was sent to you in the letter invitation to this event. So that's a really interesting um, place to go if you want a refresher of some of the things that were talked about tonight. Um, so please check that out because it's, I think it's super cool. And then you can also um, send that to anybody who is unable to attend these events if they wanted to catch up on the information before the videos are uploaded because we have to do a bit of editing before they can go onto the website. Uh, that might be a place where they can start until they can come back and watch the videos of these, of these uh, presentations. So that's the virtual information session. And I uh, don't, are there any more questions that have arisen there? Beth? No, nope, none any. have surfaced, but Vicki, would you tell mm -hmm. folks, you've described how it works if they consent to annexation and they're yep. a landowner in the area. That's right. What, what does one do if they don't consent? Right. What's the process yeah, there? If you're, if you're generally not supportive of the annexation, for whatever reason, um, you would not fill out your consent form and that's fine. What you could do if you wanted to uh, make the government aware of your position is when the municipal government board receives the application, it will notify you that it's received the application and give you time to let them know if you are uh, not in support of the annexation. And you can do that and let them know that you would like to um, speak before the municipal government board or, or provide a submission for the record um, about why you're not in support of it. So that is another opportunity if you are not in support of the annexation for you to have your voice heard at the provincial level. And that would be the last opportunity for you to put your input into this process. Thank you, Vicki. Darren, what you've got some broad perspective with many different annexation applications and processes. What would you add? Yeah, um, in our experience with um, with other municipalities and so forth, going through this process is uh, landowners who are opposed to annexation are also encouraged to let the city and the county know now. Um, what we would uh, we would do is we would we have a record of those folks that do consent to annexation, but we also have a record of those that are uh, opposed. I think it gives us an opportunity to earmark that for the municipal government board that will be handling the application. If they know from the outset that um, that there is some opposition from landowners or even from members of the public or people outside the annexation area, um, they will be put on notice that they need to start preparing for what is this. Uh, uh, public hearing that they will schedule uh, in the uh, new year, likely in spring. So um, it's helpful to know that up front, uh, over and above um, 
uh, hearing from them through their own advertising process through the mail outs and so forth that they'll that'll happen after the annexation application is submitted. And Greg, do you have anything to add? You've got another perspective in handling so many annexation applications around the province. I, I'd love to say that I have something unique to add, Beth, other than what Darren just uh, said, okay. but, uh, but I, I, I don't. He's covered it off well. Those are, in fact, the two methods of, 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 of communication uh, for, the, uh, for the landowners. They really are. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Beth Frigo, I'm going to get you to pull up that last slide that has both the website information and Vicki Dodge's email address. I just want to make sure for folks attending that you have this information and in particular Vicki's email address. There's a lot of information. This is a complicated process. If you have any questions of clarification, Vicki's email and phone number are here. Then she'll take your emails and your calls. And then the website is also there if you'd like to go and explore and look for, for more information. And I do not see any additional questions either to speak or written. So I think the best course of action right now is attendees, please feel free to go on with the rest of your, your evening. Um, panelists will stay here just in case someone shows up before seven because this is a session that was advertised to be happening between six and seven. Um, and attendees, you can stick it out to the bitter end too if you like, or you can imagine you're in a community hall somewhere and it's kind of done and you're gonna make your way home. So please do as you as you like. Thank you very much for attending. Um, Vicki, any closing comments? Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks, Beth. You know, well, that was a great session. We didn't, we didn't have an onslaught of questions. We had some really good questions and I think some really important information was conveyed. So appreciate the panelists time. Thank you for being here this evening to answer those questions. And thank you so much to our attendees for participating in this process. It's uh, so important to hear from you. And I'm um, so glad that you were able to, to join us. And if you'd like to come back for round two or round three, you can come back tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m. Again, please visit the web website. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or, or give me a phone call and we can have a, a lovely chat. I've been chatting with lots of folks the last few days. <laughs>